Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for stopping in at our Zoom author talk tonight. I wanted to thank um, BC Berwick Community Media. I want to get the new name right for all you do, you do for the Berwick Public Library to bring these great programs out to the public in our community. Um, we couldn't do it without you. It's great. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to host author um, Chris Boucher, and he is here to talk about his second book, Front Pivot, which was inspired by his father-in-law's Vietnam journal and features expert excerpts from a fictional diary by a veteran of the Afghanistan war. Chris, who has written a couple of books now, is... Um, a resident of Lowell, Mass, but he spends summers and nice weekends and springtime up in our area. So we hope to be able to invite him back in person at some point next summer when we can all start moving around a little better. Um, Chris's author talk will be of interest to veterans who may be looking for meaning in their own experience, children of veterans, and those with a keen interest in history or current events. And I wanna turn it over to Chris so you can start your program and we can save our questions for after. And please welcome Chris Boucher. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Happy to be here. I uh, appreciate that introduction. So I will share my screen. I do have some slides to share. And I'll get that started. Okay, so, so as Sharon said, I'm Chris Boucher. Thanks again for having me. Um, so welcome to my author talk, which I'm calling Inspired Writing. So I am coming to you from my home in Lowell, Massachusetts, although we do have a camp in Wells, Maine, and my family likes to spend as much time as we can there in the spring and summer um, and look forward to getting back up there again in the spring. So since we are in Zoom, I just didn't want to ask for your patience in a few, I guess, logistical areas. So for one thing, if a cat appears, it is not a guest in a filter. It's an actual cat. I have a Zoom loving cat. Um, he'll probably make an appearance. Uh, if he does, I'll do my best to get him off the screen as quickly and as humanely as possible. Also, if you do catch me looking around a little bit, that's another Zoom thing. So I have obviously the presentation in front of me, but I'm also going to be checking the clock and have some notes that I'll check from time to time to make sure I hit all of my main points. So if you see me looking around a little bit, I'm not shifty eyed or untrustworthy. Uh, it's just a Zoom thing. You can trust me on that. And finally, as Sharon said, we will do a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please uh, make note of them and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. It looks like Sharon's Zoom kitty uh, has already made an appearance. There he is. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see mine shortly. All right, so let's get started. So here are the uh, few topics that I want to discuss this evening. The first is how a journal, my father-in-law's diary of his time in Vietnam, inspired me to write a novel honoring him and his experience. Also, while, while <clears throat> why journaling or writing of any kind is good for you, it's good for your mental health and wellness. And also, how you might get started. So I do have some tips that I can share. Uh, so for those people who might be interested in a writing or researching project, um, I'll go through those and hope those help you, help you as well. Okay, so here we go. So here we see a picture, um, the cover image of my novel Front Pivot that was published in August of this year. Now I said I was inspired by a journal, but not mine. So that is uh, a journal that was kept by my father-in-law of his time in Vietnam. He wrote about what happened to him almost uh, 50, actually just over 50 years ago. So when I first had the opportunity to read it, it seemed kind of dated, seemed kind of historic almost. However, uh, given recent events and our recent involvement in Afghanistan, um, it almost seemed more like deja vu. 
And so like a lot of people, uh, especially this summer, I kind of struggled to understand what was happening in Afghanistan, as well as what had happened in Vietnam and what my father-in-law um, made of all of it. His journal was kind of a tough read. Um, sad to say, he did pass before um, I met him. So I um, started dating his daughter, Erica, my wife, in the early 90s, and he passed in 1988. So while I did have the opportunity to read the journal and was happy about that, I did not have any opportunity to interact with him or ask him questions about his experience. So I really was not able to get his take directly on it. I had to glean that from what he wrote in the conversations that I had uh, with Erica as well. That said, um, despite the kind of struggle that I had to read it and come to some kind of understanding, um, I found that a very uh, interesting experience and it inspired me to write a novel um, along the same lines. So what does my story look like? Well, it's a story of a teen who reads his deceased father's journal of his time in Afghanistan after his older brother disappears. So there's been another terror attack and the teen, Noel, is concerned that his brother somehow feels a responsibility to make up for what some regard as his father's failure in Afghanistan. So while Noel reads it, he's really more focused on the here and now and tried to see what his brother is up to. It turns out his brother read the journal as well and made notes in the margin kind of indicating um, what he was thinking about it, what his understanding of the situation was, and what responsibility he might have to do something about it. Of course, as Noel continues to read, he grows more interested in his father's story, of which he didn't know much. And of course, it all comes together in the end, and both Noel and his older brother are able to discern a meaning in their father's experience, which has uh, relevance uh, for their day-to-day -day lives. It helps them take some actions and make some decisions to solve problems that they're working through as well. Okay, so this is a picture of my father-in-law, uh, Frederick Gillis Jr. Uh, so he was father of three. He was also uh, very active in his family life. He served as a baseball and softball coach. He worked as a warehouse manager uh, for Digital Equipment Corporation in Littleton, Massachusetts. He graduated from high school in 1961. Uh, he went to Chelmsford High School in Massachusetts. He graduated from college in 1967. At the time, it was Bowl Tech. It's now known as UMass Lowell. Now, one question you might have is, for a smart individual, why did it take six years to finish college? And if you think about what was going on at the time, um, you might have an idea. So this is the era of Vietnam and the draft. And you could have your potential draft call deferred if you stayed in school. And so some folks who were not eager to be involved in that military, military conflict um, focused on their studies instead. That said, the war didn't end. Fred did graduate, he was drafted, and he went to Vietnam in 1969. So now some more on Fred. So this is a picture of him uh, in the Vietnam, excuse me, in Vietnam at the time. So you can see he experienced some downtime as well. So he kept the journal of his time over there. He wrote in it, not quite on a daily basis, but frequently enough to fill the journal. And we'll see what that looks like later. So despite his dedication in writing it on a regular basis, he didn't return to it as far as I know. And no one else read it. That said, my understanding through Erica, my wife, his daughter, is that he did have some, some vague hopes that something would come of it. So why didn't anyone read it? Well, it's complicated. Part of the trouble was um, that his daughter, Erica, my wife, died when, he was, when she was 17. So 
given the subject matter of the journal, uh, it would seem to be a conversation you would want to have amongst adults. And she wasn't yet at that point in her life. I'm sure he intended to have that conversation with her when he could. Another reason was um, family members may have been concerned about the content of the journal. So Erica's grandmother did relate to her that she burnt Fred's letters that he sent home to her from the war. Apparently they were, um, what she said, were things that no mother should read. So it would seem that he was as blunt in those letters, as blunt, excuse me, in those letters as he was in the journal. And so family members may have suspected it wouldn't be quite a comfortable read. And of course, another factor is um, the entire atmosphere around Vietnam at that time. So it was seen as a failed war. Um, the veterans of it came back to a country that was conflicted. There were many opponents of it. Um, in that era, um, veterans were not particularly welcome or didn't feel welcomed to talk about their experiences. All right, so now what about me? So who am I? Why am I here? What right do I have to talk about this? So as I said earlier, um, and as you can see in the picture, hopefully I married Fred's daughter Erica in 1996. Again, we, I never had the opportunity to, to meet Fred. Unfortunately, he passed in 1988. So what credentials do I have? Well, I do have a master's degree in creative writing from Southern New Hampshire University. During part of my studies there, I worked on two novels, which I've been fortunate to have published, and this is the second. And while I do write by night, um, I have a day job as well. I'm an instructional designer. Uh, I enjoy creative writing in my spare time. So to me, um, the, the reason I felt a right, a responsibility to, to pursue um, doing something with this journal was that I had the access to it, the interest, and the ability. So Erica shared the journal with me. She shared his vague hopes for it. I think we're fortunate in that he captured ex his experience for our posterity. I think it's pretty cool that we're here today talking about experience of his that happened over 50 years ago and also over 30 years after his death. I also think the story is very relevant concerning recent events. I found it meaningful to me, and I suspected it would be meaningful to others as well. All right, so that's the kind of introductions to the people. So now let's get a little bit more deeply into the journal. So here you see. Fred's journal. It looks it's all, it looks all of the 50 years old that it is, really. See, it's pretty worn. It's pretty thick. It obviously has been handled um, quite a bit. So Fred filled the pages of the diary with his thoughts and feelings as he experienced them on a daily basis. Some passages are long, descriptive, and thoughtful, while others are short and hastily written. His writing ebbed and flowed. When he first went over, and when he came back from an R&R &R trip, he wrote more. In the thick of it, he wrote less. In the journal, you can see he tried to believe in the mission, but he expressed confusion about it too. His faith in the mission flickered in and out as his experience played out. At times, you can hear him try to convince himself of the worth of the mission. At other times, not so much. At times he's homesick. At others, he suggests he might not fit in when he goes back home. He knew things had changed. He also struggled to differentiate friend from foe in Vietnam. He didn't know who to trust, but he also seemed to befriend some locals and express sympathy when things went poorly for him and poorly for them. On top of all that, it was a difficult read because of what he described, the content, but also because of his handwriting use of shorthand and military acronyms as well. And as I mentioned earlier, it seemed dated until very recently when it seemed more like deja vu. These current events breathe new life into a story.
So now let's go through some similarities between the two wars. I think many of these uh, will seem obvious to us. So they are the two longest U.S. wars, Vietnam, uh, slightly, slightly over 10 years, and our involvement in Afghanistan, slightly under 20 years. In a way, both were kind of strange wars in that they were fought against abstractions, against ideas. So Vietnam was against communism, and Afghanistan was against terrorism. And for some reason, these specific countries became kind of the focal point for, the glo for our concern uh, globally about these two issues. And I think this um, concern with abstractions is probably why neither war really seemed to have a clear and measurable definition of success. Many considered these wars failures, especially with how they ended. So in both cases, the governments we supported collapsed very quickly after we left. Digging a little bit more into the countries and their history, they both had a historic and ongoing foreign involvement in their internal affairs, internal affairs. Um, and also the population due to that had a distrust of foreigners. Further, the governments we supported were corrupt. And this was well known and we looked the other way in both cases. So neither did we have credibility, nor the governments that we supported, um, nor did they have support from their people. So really no surprise at their collapse. So given all of that, you can see how difficult service in either of these wars would have been for folks. So a little more um, on Fred's experience in Vietnam. So he served in 1969, that was near the end of the war. At that point, um, Nixon was president. Um, his goal was to seek an honorable peace. So basically, the war was given up as lost. The only question was what what terms would we get to end it? Again, a difficult time to serve. So while Fred didn't particularly um, want to serve, he didn't want to run either. So his parents, like many did during that time, had offered to uh, provide him a means to escape to Canada and thus avoid the draft, but he was not interested in that. Further, when he did uh, report for duty, when he did uh, receive his draft notice and was sent overseas, um, he didn't try to hide or shirk from duty. In fact, he often volunteered uh, for dangerous missions. Um, Eric explained to me that his thought there was that if he was trying to keep himself safe, then he would be doing it um, at the risk of others, exposing other people to danger. So he was not interested in that as well. He did see a lot of action. One area in particular where he served was the Michelin Woods. That was close to the border. Uh, there are travel and smuggling routes into other countries. So the enemy um, could go to the hide. They could go to their escape the country. Um, they might also use those routes to resupply and even bring in reinforcements. Now, Fred's takeaway from the difficult situa situation seemed to be that what matters most is the people around you. So in a situation where the mission, um, there's some doubt about the mission, it's, it's most important to take care of those people that, that are with you, that are exposed to danger along with you. And I think there's a lot of evidence of that, both in the journal, um, in his talks with his daughter, and what he was comfortable in sharing, and also his medals. So let's look at those next. So this is a picture of Fred's um, gravestone in the cemetery, the Polish cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts. And as I said, he died way too early in 1988. He does have an impressive list of medals. And here are some of the highlights. Purple Heart, Bronze Star Medal, two Bronze Service Stars. He also received a Vietnam Service Medal and a National Defense Service Medal. So you can see that despite his one tour of duty in Vietnam and the concerns that he had both with going over and then sometimes expressed in the journal of participating, he did experience a number of challenges and he did well. He fulfilled his service, <clears throat> excuse me, he fulfilled his service honorably and well. All right, so this is our last section 
um, of the lecture, but it's certainly not the end. So as I mentioned earlier, there are many benefits of writing. And let's go through some of those. So recently, um, Anna Rossi of Health Day Living um, has said that writing is not just a creative outlet, it's also a healing art. And there are many benefits that come along with it. It is said to ease symptoms of depression, help control pain, lessen stress, and fight fatigue. Uh, it boosts the immune system. It also frees the brain to focus on the present. So the thought is that writing about your experience gives it a place to go so you can move on without forgetting about it, knowing that you can return to that place to take it up again. This seems to save you from having it constantly churning in the background and threaten to bubble up to the surface. Also, I listened to a recent podcast on the art of manualist, excuse me, the art of manliness, which suggests journaling and sharing stories helps people move on from traumatic experiences. So memory scientist, Dr. Scott Small, says that working to process traumatic experiences actually builds new neural connections in the brain. So it allows memories which are associated with raw emotion to kind of shrink back and people to build new positive connections um, to these memories from the past. So these benefits I think are helpful for people who've experienced trauma, but also you know people in everyday life. I think I've experienced the benefits myself. Finally, one um, other key is it's your chance to have your say. So it's a chance, it was a chance for Fred to preserve his legacy. While, of course, he lives on through his loved one's memories of him, the journal also gives us direct access to his innermost thoughts and feelings as he was thinking and feeling them. So now let's be a little more specific about the benefits of writing. So about Fred specifically. So do I think it helped him? Well, I suspect it did. So he had complicated entries. He had mixed feelings about his thoughts, about his experience over there. Um, his stance on the war and his role seemed to waver from time to time. But he had a place to put those thoughts. And that was a journal. And he did that almost every day. So it may be that the decision he made to put those thoughts and feelings there um, gave him some space so that he could focus on the present um, and make sure that he paid appropriate attention to the day-to-day -day dangers that were all around him. It may have helped him survive. And of course, it also preserved his memory. If he hadn't written the journal, I really wouldn't have known that much about him. I certainly wouldn't have written the novel and we surely wouldn't be here talking about him today. So looking closer to my own example, so has it helped me? Well, I think it has. So at the time of 9-11, I was 30 years old. I was healthy, I was young, and I was fit. However, I did not serve. And I think I've had some feelings of guilt about that since. I know that people certainly, a lot of people enlisted after that event. Um, I know people certainly older than me did. So I, so from time to time, I think I have wondered, you know, if I missed an opportunity there, if I owed something um, to people that I didn't fulfill. However, uh, working through his experience and trying to make sense of it um, helped me to see what I may have missed and that it wasn't entirely all good. I think that it underscored for me that we do have a choice to make. And I think I made the right choice for me. And then reflecting on my own life and the practical opportunities that are and were available to me, I've come to realize there are many ways to serve. And while I won't give away any spoilers, I tried to work that into the novel too. So we've talked about the benefits um, of writing. And so if you're looking for some kind of quick tips about how you might start, um, I can share some of those with you. So I think one thing you would want to decide early on is whether you're writing fact or fiction. So if you're writing a journal about kind of day-to-day -day, day -day events, 
Um, that's fine. So that would be fact. However, uh, if you are interested in maybe the bigger picture or finding meaning um, in the things that are happening to you, you might try a more creative approach. Uh, you might try to work on it as a, as a piece of fiction. And in that way, um, allow yourself to take some liberties, some creative liberties, and focus more on the meaning than the actual event. That said, if you're not sure, I would say start with the journal, start with fact, because that should be easier. Another tip is have a consistent schedule. So you might want to write in the morning with coffee, uh, in the afternoon with lunch, maybe in the evening with a, a beer or a glass of wine. But I think it's important that you have a set aside time uh, where you're going to make a commitment to your writing. Maybe it's just an hour or so as you start, 30 minutes to an hour, it doesn't have to be heavy. I think you also want to consider having a space that's separate from what you're using the rest of your day. Uh, so for example, if you work from home, like some folks do these days, maybe you want to do it outside of the house, or maybe it's in another room. Or if you're in an office for the day, then maybe that's when you want to do at lunch at the park or, or something similar. So these are some things to think about. Also, while I think you want to have a, a regular schedule, I think you have to be flexible and realistic about it too. Um, I wouldn't feel that you have to write every day. Maybe three out of five, three out of five weekdays will do to start, or maybe just doing it on weekends uh, would help as well. The idea is you're trying to relieve um, tension and pressure, not add to it. But you do want a framework that works so you can make some progress in this regard. Another thing you would want to think about are tools. So how would you go about doing this? Do you want to use pen and paper or do you want to use a PC? And so there are, there are different thoughts that go into this. Some people like the feeling um, of actually going in, having a pencil in hand, physically writing on paper. Other people have grown away from that through the use of computers and don't enjoy that experience. So that's something to consider. Another factor here is that if you're using a PC, you have some built-in tools for checking your spelling and checking your grammar. So if you are working on kind of a larger work, that might help. Also, it's either to, easier to move text around if that's something you're interested in as well. So I would say getting started, kind of feel, pick what feels like most comfortable to you, but is also aligned with your larger goal. As far as techniques go, so whether you are writing fact or fiction, um, I, I was discussing with Sharon earlier, so I have done some writing workshops where I focus on what I call the three Cs. And these are character, conflict, and context. And depending, of what, depending on what type of writing um, you're doing, it, it's not, you wanna apply the three Cs to each of those because that's how you're gonna make your writing real and really bring it to life. You want to make sure that you're focusing on all of those things. And you might think, well, if I'm just journaling and I'm writing about what has happened to me, isn't that good enough? Well, maybe it isn't if you go back to it five to 10 years and because you didn't record, for example, some sensory detail, um, you may not recall that after that fact. So I would try to be as specific um, and as real as you can. And also, if you're trying to convince others of the reality of what you're writing, you're going to make sure that you capture those to make sure that your writing is uh, realistic and robust. So I think it's key uh, that you work in those three Cs, character, conflict, and context. Context is also known as setting, but that's not a C, so I go with context for that third C. So that's technique. The last one is look for help. So um, I've got a phone ringing in the background. I apologize for that. By the time I get to it, it'll probably stop. So in terms of help, you might look for a writing group. You might look for some readers um, to give you feedback. Those are th some things that you would want to think about. If you do join a group and you get feedback, take it seriously, especially if you get multiple folks um, telling you the same thing. Don't ignore patterns. But at the same time, be true to your vision. So there's a balance there that you're going to want to establish. Finally, if you are someone who's writing about a traumatic experience, for example, a veteran, make sure you're aware of the local support that's available. Uh, for example, um, VA offers counseling services. 
Maine Bureau of Veterans Services um, does as well. So if you are writing about events that may trigger um, unhappy memories um, that you think you may want to talk to someone about, make sure you're available of what, make sure you're aware of what is available to you. Okay, lastly, researching tips. So if your experience is closer to mine, where you're going to be researching before you're writing, um, here are some tips on how to go about it. So the first is make sure you read your primary source closely. So in my example, as I talked about, this is my father-in-law's journal that I had. So I read it twice, I read it three times. I was careful not to rush to judgment on anything that I read. I was care careful not to um, bring conclusions of my own that weren't supported by what was there. A lot was confusing, so I made sure I read it and came to the best understanding that I could. Another is to talk to people. So if your primary source, if you have access to the author, make sure you speak to them. If you have access to a family member, talk to them as well, because they should be able to provide some more context, things that aren't clear in the journal, or maybe some things that you have questions about in that primary source. It's also important to read other personal and historical accounts to give you more perspective, um, to give you a sense of the bigger picture there. And also make sure you're aware of both facts and opinions. So Fred's medals, which we um, discussed earlier, are facts. Um, thoughts on Fred's experience are opinions. Um, and the two are different. You want to be sure that you don't confuse them. One tip. One other tip that I would add is that if you are looking for facts going back further in time, there are a lot of useful um, kind of genealogy sites that are available now. I know a lot of folks know about Ancestry.com, but there's also one called Family Search, which is actually uh, free, freely available. So um, it is not a subscription service, no cost is required. Um, a lot of original documentation is posted there. So while I didn't need to use that, um, during my experience of researching Fred's history, um, I have used it more recently to look up some things about my grandfather who emigrated um, from Canada to the US in the 1920s. And just in a matter of hours on family search, I was able to find documentation about his entry into the US, um, his gaining citizenship in the US, and also through some censuses was able to track his movement um, in a town from, from boarding house to apartment to, to single family house and, and access data that showed kind of the evolution of his success in the U.S. Um, as well as his marriage and a growing family. Okay, so that's my presentation. I think we'll open it up to questions now. And as we do that, I'll just show you where you get even more answers. Um, one is my website. ChrisBoucher.net. Uh, if you want to contact me directly, the best way is to use that email, Chris at ChrisBoucher.net. And thank you for your time. Chris, I have a question. Sure. What's the difference between a journal and a diary? I don't know that there is a difference. Um, I think the idea is that this is a, a book in which you're recording your personal thoughts. So I think that uh, the two are often used interchangeably. Um, as far as diary goes, or maybe a, a connotation to this almost being like a, a teenage thing, and maybe it's closer to, to feelings rather than experiences, which is when a journal, um, the term journal might be used. But I think they're, for the most part, uh, both are able to be used to cover both. Just another question. In your father-in-law's uh, journal, did he talk about drug use in Vietnam? Because there was a lot of concern because a lot of veterans uh, use drugs just to escape the stress and strain. And ironically, when they came back, and a lot of studies have been done, they weren't addicted. You know, they might have been using heroin or cocaine in Vietnam, and they came back and wasn't an issue. Not for all. Does he speak to uh, any use of drugs in his uh, diary? So interestingly, he does not. However, I am familiar with, I guess, the recent study that you're referring to. So I think that um, a lot of, there was a lot of concern 
uh, from military folks in the U.S. government about veterans returning home who had been using heroin and opium, opium over there that they do it here. And it turns out many did not because they didn't have access to it. So Afghanistan and its veterans might be a totally different story because they're returning to a different, um, I guess, drug culture, or there's a different availability of drugs right now. However, to your specific question, um, no, he didn't mention it. And as far as I know, he did not um, have an issue with it, nor did anyone that he um, served with. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I was wondering what your wife, did she, so you said she never read the journal before you started this project. Mm -hmm. Did she read it with you, along with you, as you started the research, or has she ever read it? No, the answer is still no. And I think part of it goes back to uh, her grandmother telling her she burned his letters home. Just very, I mean, he was very honest and blunt about kind of what he went through. Um, and I think that was a factor. Another factor was his, his absence. So there was no, um, so it wasn't something you could, you could speak to him about. So probably helped that I had the distance of never having met yeah. him, that this was really all I would have, all I would really ever have. Whereas other people, you know, other loved ones were more conflicted because they had something else that maybe was good and, and they liked that and they don't necessarily want that to be challenged. So it's right. tricky. Yeah. Very complicated. Yeah. Can I ask you if you were shocked by anything that you read? Um, you know, if you're saying he's very blunt, was there anything that kind of put you at unease in, in retrospect? Yeah, I think it was the, the violence of it. So my not knowing much going in, um, and I guess maybe being ignorant of, of Vietnam as well, I was kind of surprised by the, the violence and how close he was to it and how kind of honest he was in describing some of those encounters. Another thing is just the honesty of it. And so this is an excerpt that is similar to one that appears in the novel as well, really just talking about his, his nervousness um, during an encounter that they had with the enemy and also kind of a sick feeling that he had afterward that he didn't want, that he hated to be part of that kind of and didn't want to be, uh, he hoped not to be put in that situation again. Mm. How many kids are, did he have, your, your wife and any other children? Yes, so three total, um, two girls and one boy. Yeah. So do you share, have you had other talks where you have veterans that have shared this? I would imagine it would be a, a really great thing for Vietnam veterans to sit in another outlet besides writing to sit and talk about too. Yeah, and I think the research su suggests that sharing uh, is helpful to help folks with that trauma. It does get a little tricky and I am actually, since I'm a Lowell resident, I've been talking to the Lowell Library and we oh, yeah. are going to be meeting shortly with, with a counselor um, as well because we're thinking through doing a writing workshop specifically for veterans. However, the concern is, well, what if you know the, the process of mem remembering his experience and going back um, and trying to record it, what if that triggers you know, a traumatic um, memory. So the, yeah. the goal is for, to help them process it and get through it, but that is a process, right? And if, that, if they're just starting this process um, after leaving these memories maybe untouched uh, for quite a while, what if that triggers a traumatic episode? And so we will be meeting shortly with someone who is a counselor to see how we might build that into a program. Fantastic, yeah. And it's tricky for me because I, so I'm not a veteran, so I don't have that experience. So it's hard to, um, so I would be coming in from the perspective of some perspective of someone who might be able to help them do some writing and, and put it in a way that it would be effective and kind of meaningful uh, for their family members or for others. Uh, however, I can't relate to that specific uh, combat experience that they've had um, and what that does to them. So, so there's certainly a concern there that at the start of that process that, you have those bases covered. Yeah. And was Fred, um, did he, 
study writing in college? I mean, was that his background or was he just insightful enough to know that this is an experience that he would, he wanted to write down, not necessarily to mm -hmm. share because he kept it to himself for so long. Um, mm -hmm. But did he have a background in writing that he No, no so I think he had it? an engineering degree. So Lowell yeah. Technical School. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Still, as UMass Lowell is really known um, most for principally engineering. for engineering. And I think that that was his background. I'll have to ask my wife what specific degree he had, um, but I believe it's in engineering. Yeah, it, very interesting. But the, yeah, the question of why why you start that journal in the first place, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that. It is an interesting one. I'm glad he did it. And I'm glad that you know we have the opportunity to kind of think through his experience today and how it might uh, be meaningful even today, after 50 years, given kind of what we just went through, um, you have to wonder, you know, when we were making decisions 20 years ago to go into Afghanistan, how much thought did we give to our previous experiences, um, um, especially in Vietnam, which it turns out in some ways was eerily similar. So it's interesting. Well, I think it was, and I, I know Larry could, describe it better. It was such um, a tumultuous time. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot that people want to take away from it and remember, and there's a lot that people want to forget too. So finding that bridge that you can comfortably do it um, is tough. And I think you've really done it with this, this type of work, although it's fiction, you're using, you know, your resource of your father-in-law and his voice is actually being heard through this book. So great job. Very interesting. Well, thank you. I will thank have you. the book at the library and I am, I do hope you can come when you're up in Wells and let me know, we'll set it up and we can have you come to the library in person and I am very interested in talking to you more about this writing group. And let me know how you do with your veterans writing group. Sounds yeah, like a well. really great thing. Yeah, yeah, it could be helpful. And hopefully, you know, the veterans are interested as well. I mean, other potential audiences could be family members. Maybe it's not the veteran himself doing the journaling, but a family member kind of interviewing them and then sure. recording that. Uh, I'm not sure I could see it going in different directions, but it would be nice, you know, again, for someone like me, who's not a veteran, to who thinks that he learned something through his experience to kind of give something back to those folks. So I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I'd definitely be um, interested in coming up in the spring as well. I'm yeah. just happy to kind of be here and, and be talking about <laughs> this. Like I said, 50 years later, we're talking about it because I think it's meaningful. And I think we need to pay more attention to these things and maybe we'll make some better decisions going forward if we do. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Chris? I have a quick question. Uh, he was, was he enlisted or was he an officer? Enlisted. Enlisted. And he, he, uh, he gave no thought to, I mean, he apparently had a bachelor's degree. Uh, he didn't, was he in a combat unit? I mean, was he infantry or was he, was he in some kind of a, you know, a engineering unit? Um, so I think it was infantry. So he drove a track. So I guess it would be mobile infantry if I have that right. Okay. I, I don't know much about the, the, the army. I'm just, yeah, um, yeah. yeah he, he was definitely, like he had a, he had ground. some advantages there that he, he didn't take advantage. He didn't really use. I mean, he could have probably, I don't know, maybe have gone to OCS and gotten himself a, you know, commission as an engineering officer. Yeah, he may have passed on that. I can't, I can't answer that specifically. I do know what he describes. He was on the front lines. He was, you know, dealing with the enemy um, on a regular basis. I do know he was on, I guess it would, would be a mobile unit. He describes driving the track, uh, which sounds like is a, is a mechanized troop carrier. Um, and also being on, on foot for some missions as well. 
So Larry, are you a veteran or a historian? Sharon had mentioned you might have some thoughts on the topic. No, I, I'm really more into psychology. And it's interesting talking okay. about writing, which you were perfectly correct, that it puts you in the here and now. You know, so you're not dealing with the past and the future and et cetera. And uh, it's really uh, kind of alternative drugs that it does uh, mm -hmm. kind of give you an outlet, a cognitive outlet that uh, is therapeutic, no question about it. Yeah. And that's probably how he used it. The other interesting thing I picked up was that he was a coach, meaning that he understood teams that is being with others. And when you said he didn't want to let people down, he didn't want to hide. That, that to me, makes perfect amount of sense that he wanted to be a team player and be supportive. You know, sometimes, as you know, Michael, officers <laughs> can be a little more aloof. Um, no. Not always. <laughs> no. So, um, but yeah, it seems like he wanted to be part of the action. And uh, it sounds like he certainly was. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great insight. So, Michael, were you an officer? Are you a veteran? Uh, yes. Okay. I've I've been on active duty twice. I I got recalled for uh, for the Gulf War. Okay. So, can I ask you a question? Actually, so if I wanted detail on some of these medals, so I understand the Bronze Star. There's probably a story attached to that. Is that something that's well, publicly gonna, available? Usually, there's a citation that goes with the, uh, with the medal and it details, you know, what he did to earn it. Uh, so you would have, I don't know how one would go about finding the site, the actual citations. He must have a, um, he must have a service record somewhere yeah. and you may be able to write off to the VA to get it. Uh, there's, okay. there's very, there's time limits on that. Um, he may be a little, too recent to get it you, for you to get all of his uh, his service jacket. Okay, Chris, did he have a, a DD two fourteen, which is a discharge? Because that usually has information on it. Um, if so, I haven't seen it. I guess that, okay. that could be something I could pursue. As, as starting to talk through this, some of these other questions have kind of been raised, and and doing my own kind of research. I know I mentioned the Family Search website. Um, someone was mentioning to me that there might be military sites as well, where some I could get some more detail on some of these questions that remain unanswered. And what about so the National see. Archives? Have you tried? I don't know. Is, that, is that like a database? Is that an information uh, repository? Military uh, details. I, I'm pretty sure they have a mil military section, but the National Archives has, you know all kinds of our, it's, it's our archive. So I think okay. everything, um, you can find out all the information you need to find where to look, probably from their website. Okay, I'll have to do that. Yeah. It's interesting that in the Q&A, I have more questions than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy to participate and learn as well. <laughs> That's great. We all have questions, yeah. Well, this has been great, Chris. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, thanks Thank for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yes, and I, I look forward to having you to the Berwick Public Library in person. Yeah, it sounds great. Great. I'll do it in the spring. Very good. Does anyone have any other questions for Chris? Or Okay. Well, great. Great job. And we got through with no technical difficulties, which is... Par for the course these and days. No cat. So. I'm actually disappointed. And you have no the cat. cat I'm very disappointed. <laughs> I guess I bored him with my droning. He's used to a more interactive format. Yeah, we're cat people, so we're we're good with that. <laughs> Chris, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Very informative. Thank you. Great Thanks program. for listening. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank Take you care. very much, everybody. Have a good Bye. evening. The live you stream. Too. Take care. All right. Thanks, Terry, and bye, everybody. Bye.